uh, lecture what 34 okay so most of this class I'm going to discuss about uh, the exam today okay so we'll go through the solutions and uh, yeah we'll see if there's some time left towards the end i'll do some brief review of what we've been doing so far okay so first of all how did the exam go everybody is happy you know smiling huh? okay so i saw briefly i saw a few papers I glanced through them i think the first question most people have done something you know attempted something basically because probably because it involved uh, simple geometry people are able to do it but even the second part of the first question which involved a simple q function calculation several people have not done okay so that was that was quite surprising to me okay so it was actually was just quickly just looking at the picture and writing down q, two q functions some several people have not done it is very surprising even if you didn't do the decision regions you can quickly do an approximate computation of beta right so anyway let me see I'll tell you what i expected from the first question then you can see how it works out okay so the okay so so the constellation was minus 2 plus 2 okay so this is uh, 1 comma 5 and minus 1 comma minus 5 okay so 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 of course the perpendicular bisectors are going to be involved one of the perpendicular bisectors has already been given which is the y axis right so one perpendicular bisector is the y axis so you don't have to do any work to do it and uh, and, you, and you can see that that perpendicular bisector will be very will be very useful right so, so it's separating two things that are very close by so of course that perpendicular bisector will be very useful so you can't throw that out so i think most people have done that the next thing is when you draw perpendicular bisectors for uh, this line and this line so they'll have to intersect somewhere right so they'll have to intersect at one common point that's what the triangles perpendicular bisectors do you must have learnt it at some point in your life right if you draw three perpendicular bisectors they intersect at some point what's so special about that point what is that point called circumcenter so if you draw a circle using that from that point with the radius is the length of the something it will pass through all that so you must have I'm sure you must have learnt that some point in your life right so that's so I think most people did that roughly but people are confused about that also I mean they're quite surprised to see that the three lines were actually intersecting I mean anyway but they, they intersected and you will get something like this okay so maybe my drawing is not to scale so that will be the perpendicular bisectors there so this picture is exactly symmetric so you don't have to worry so much about the perpendicular bisectors on the other side they will have to intersect here so once you do this finish that's it the decision region is done okay so you don't have to worry about the other perpendicular bisector because it won't add to the decision region in any way this is the only perpendicular bisectors that matter i think i don't know i think it might have taken some time for you to figure out but i didn't expect it to take 15 minutes okay so maybe maybe you took 15 minutes uh, some of you okay so how do you find this point all right let's work out 11 by 5 a quick way of finding it is to see that this vector and this vector have to be this vector this vector and this vector will have to be what will have to be perpendicular right so the dot products have to vanish so first thing is to find this point can you find that point very easily that midpoint yeah so that point will work out to 3 by 2 comma 5 by 2 okay so then you can find this vector you can find both the vectors in terms of that point y it's a question of figuring out a simple equation that you'll get you'll get 11 by 5 okay so it's an easy easy thing to do so this point will be minus 11 by 5 and your decision region is very clearly set okay so that's the that's the first problem okay so that's part a for part b i had given the bit assignments as 0 0 0 1 am i right 1 0 here and then 1 1 if you look at the second bit right if you so so quick way of writing it is to fix one transmitted point okay so you fix a transmitted point you're doing pairwise right so you fix one transmitted point for instance minus 2 is a good point to fix you see fix that point then you ask the question what's the most likely way in which i'll make an error in my second bit minus 2 will become plus 2 so you have to only worry about that pairwise error probability okay if minus 2 becomes 1 plus 5 5j or minus 1 minus 5j what happens 
right if it becomes 1 plus 5j there's no error in bit 2 if it becomes minus 1 minus 5j there can be an error in bit 2 but that is a much larger distance pair wise so you can ignore that error in relation with this error so when you do approximation that's the approximation you do okay so you can quickly write probability for bit 2 as q 2 by sigma right so this this will work roughly it's a rough rough uh, estimate of the probability of error okay so this is fine i think most people found this thing difficult to write which is very surprising you don't need to do the decision regions to write this answer right for bit 1 what is the answer so same once again fix minus 2 so you see bit 1 to be in error you should go to either 1 plus 5j or minus 1 minus 5j so this distance is important what is this distance root 34 Okay, but there are two possibilities. So we'll get two times q root 34 by 2 sigma. So this is fine. I mean, that's all. This is what I expected for part B. I think several people have not written this. I don't know. I was I was very surprised. This is it's the simplest pairwise computation, straightforward approximation. Should take only two minutes for any. Not even two minutes. I think it takes 10 seconds for two people to write. Okay. So that's the first problem. So So moral of the story is parallelogram is difficult to slice. Okay, it's not as simple as the rectangle. Rectangle will work out very nicely. Parallelogram is difficult to slice, and uh, so in some wireless diversity applications, your transmit constellation will be intentionally made a parallelogram, or it will become a parallelogram because of the way the channel works, the different fading on different dimensions. Okay, and so in those cases. you have to carefully slice a par parallelogram at the receiver okay a better alternative would be to simply rotate it undo the rotation make it rectangular and do your previous slicing because implementing the slicer and in, in the receiver is more painful you have to compute so many straight lines you might be just better off computing the distance to each of the point and picking the minimum okay so better way to do it is to rotate it and then do a rectangular slicer okay any questions on this are okay All right, so these expressions are very, very critical. Okay, so you should you should be able to look at a constellation, look at the mapping, and very quickly write the dominant bit error rate expression. There's nothing in it. Just find this nearest neighbor, which will give you a bit error. Write Q of d by 2 sigma. There's nothing more to it. Right? When you compare these two, which will be smaller? The two bit error rates, which will be smaller? Which bit has a lower probability of error? bit 1 right it will be smaller so you quickly say that because the q argument is larger for bit 1 the outside constant doesn't matter that's that much because q goes much much lower okay so you see bit 1 is more protected than bit 2 all right so that's the first question and i think more or less people did it okay for the decision region but for some reason writing these q expressions was difficult for many people which is quite surprising you should be able to quickly write it there's nothing in it it's just a approximate term it's no big no problem I think the question also mentioned approximate, right? Should be 26, sir. Huh? Which one? So this distance is important, is what you're saying. This is root 26. It's okay. I mean, if you did, so if instead of 24, if you did two times root 26, also is fine. Oh, these two distances are different, is it? Oh yeah, you're right. These two distances are different. So this will work out as 26. It doesn't matter. I mean, one of these things is good enough. Okay, so maybe root 26 is not too bad a number. Think of then 26, 34, whatever you want to write. It's fine. Just pick one distance and work it out. It'll work out. Okay. All right. So that's the first question. The second question, I should say, also surprised me a little bit, as I thought it was a direct formula application for the standard form. So h of z is given as one. So any term involving h will be one. You don't have to worry about it. And but S n of z was given as what? One by three minus two z plus z inverse by two. I think many people wrote this, and then surprisingly there was amazing discomfort in factoring this. Okay, so I, I couldn't believe that people. I think out of 40 people, five people wrote one root of this. I was quite surprised. It's it's a quadratic equation. I think if you can't factor a quadratic polynomial, I don't know. I don't know where to start. Okay, so it's a serious problem. I think it's it's more a crisis of confidence as opposed to anything else. I think you some, for some reason you thought this will be a ultimately difficult spectral factorization. It's just solving a 
quadratic equation. There's nothing in it. If you write it down, what will this work out to? 4 by 6 minus, no, 4 minus, no, is it 4? No, 2, right? Sorry. 2 by 4 minus z square minus z power minus 2. Okay. So, I'll show you how to do this. I think I should show that once because this may be, may be one step which is slightly counterintuitive. So, one way I like of doing it is I don't like factoring polynomials like this. So I always like it in the standard form. So, a good idea is to simply take minus z power minus 2 out. So, then you would get z power 4 minus 4z squared plus 1. Okay. So, how many of you know how to factor this polynomial? Okay, so it seems like many people didn't know. I think this pages after pages were written before they wrote down the final answer. Okay, so it was very surprising, and I didn't I didn't expect it when I wrote when I when I set the question paper. I didn't expect people will take more than two minutes for this. Okay, so if you took more than two minutes, I don't know what to do. Okay, so this will factor as uh, two minus root three and two plus. Am I right? Two plus root three. Okay. So, how do you do this? Once again, for people who are not very clear, how do you do this factoring? You have to use the age-old formula minus b plus or minus square root of b square minus 4ac by 2a. Okay. So, apparently the BBC did a survey of people who learned the quadratic formula and found that only 1% of the people who ever learned it actually use it. <laughs> so, now I know why. <laughs> it's not because they don't have any use for it, it's because they have forgotten maybe, I don't know. Okay. So, it's, it's as simple as this. So, now there is slightly a confusing thing to get it into the form that we want. Okay, so what's the form that we want? We want positive constant times a minimum phase causal times that minimum phase is maximum phase. So, so it's very simple. Then next identification is to figure out which of these roots are inside the unit circle. Okay, so once again, I think many of you have calculators. It might be easy to calculate that two minus root three is less than 1. Okay? And when you take a square root also, it will be less than 1. Okay? So, you can quickly figure out that this part has to correspond to the, the first term here has to correspond to the minimum phase. So, definitely the other term has to correspond to a maximum phase. right? So, it has to happen because this is a valid power speckle density. It has to factor like that. So, it is actually enough pretty much if you find the minimum phase component. The maximum phase component will work work itself out and then you can figure the constant out. You can do it in various ways, but I will show you how I, how I did it. So, it is not too difficult. So, I, I want this to be 1 minus some constant times z power minus 2. So, it is good to multiply the z power minus 2 out that way. So, you get 2 minus root 3 z power minus 2. Okay? Then you have another term which has to definitely work out to what? 1 minus 2 minus root 3 z squared. It has to work out to that. You can either write it that way and then figure out the constant or you can directly also figure out what the constant has to be. So, you will see this plus sign has to go to the other side. It will become 2 plus root 3 minus z squared and then what you should do? What should you do? It's just a question of making this monic. So, pull the 2 plus root 3 outside. You get 2 plus root 3 times 1 minus 2 minus root 3 z power minus 2. So, maybe this is a cause for confusion. So, 1 by 2 plus root 3 but this is 2 minus root 3. What is the solution for that? What do you do? You have to make the denominator rational, right? So, you multiply and divide by 2 minus root 3. You will see amazingly, this becomes also 1 minus 2 minus root 3 z squared. Okay, so, for some reason, I think many people were not confident enough to do this. That's, that's very surprising to me. So, maybe your DSP has been learnt and forgotten for a long time, but, but you should be able to factor polynomials. Okay, so, it's a very simple polynomial. I didn't, I didn't really expect people would be stumped on this, but I saw a lot of people are working very hard at it, writing complicated equations to do this. So, I do not know. Okay, So, that is the first thing. So, you are able to quickly identify gamma n squared, m n z and then this becomes, oh well, well, these are all 1 by, right? Because it is coming, okay. So, let me, let me write the proper thing out and then write the denominator. So, this is just the denominator. So, I should remember when I factor s n of z, these things are going to go to the denominator. So, I will get 2 by 2 plus root 3 times 1 by 1 minus 2 minus root 3 z power minus 2 1 by 1 minus 2 minus root 3 z square. Is this okay? So, you see this becomes gamma n square. This becomes m n z. This becomes m n star of 1 by z star. Okay. So, there was a problem involving cos square omega factoring in the one of the tutorials. Okay, so, I was hoping 
people will remember that also when they did this but seems like it's been forgotten okay so once you do this the other factoring is also very easy so when you find sc of z what do you get okay one more thing was what what do you take es what do you take for es one just take one <laughs> don't keep es as a constant somewhere so it's okay it doesn't matter it doesn't make a big difference some people are taking es i know i didn't mention it explicitly in the paper but i was hoping somebody will take it as one many people took it as one but some people have taken it as es itself and worried about it but anyway we'll see so we'll have mod h square which is just plus one plus sn right so sn will work out as 2 by 4 minus z square minus z power minus 2 so when you do this you see what you get for sz is 6 minus z square minus z power minus 2 by 4 minus z square minus z power minus 2 so one factoring you've already done so it's just a question of repeating the same thing for 6 minus z square minus z power minus 8 so if you do that i believe if i remember correctly you get something like 3 plus root 8 am i right okay so you get 3 plus root 8 times 1 minus 3 minus root 8 z power minus 2 1 minus 3 minus root 8 z squared divided by 2 plus root 3 divided by 1 minus 2 minus root 3 z power minus 2 divided by 1 minus 2 minus root 3 z square okay so once you do this it's very easy to identify this as gamma z square this as mzz this as mz star 1 by z star that's it so it's it's after this it is just straightforward formula application so you do zero forcing dfe mmse dfe you know exactly what the precursor is what the postcursor is just plug it in you'll get the answer structure for the zero forcing dfe and the mmse dfe and i've also asked dfe so even the mean square error is trivial to compute once you do the factorization right so the mean square error for zf dfe will work out as what gamma n squared which is 2 by 2 plus root 3 okay and for the mmse dfe you will get 2 by 3 plus root 8 okay if you do that calculation so you see clearly this is less than this okay so you can quickly see that but if you see the precursor for MMSE DFE, it will be a much more complicated filter than the precursor for zero forcing DFE, which will be a simple, well, three tap filter. Okay. The postcursor is okay for both of them, but the precursor for MMSE DFE will be a complicated pole zero thing. In fact, it might even be a IAR anti causal stable version. So, so it may be one of those things. So, the precursor in the MMSE DFE is more difficult to implement. Okay. So, that's the only thing you have to make. Okay. So, this is what I was expecting. I think. I think mostly it was some confusion on, on people's part. Maybe you didn't believe that this question is as simple as it is. Okay, so I don't know. I think for some reason the speckle factorization defeated many people, and I was quite, I was quite surprised uh, at this. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, so hopefully it's okay. So, so, so one more thing is basically the. This, for some reason, digital communication is considered to be a tough course and people go into it with, with lots of confusion. It's actually very simple. It involves high school geometry and high school algebra. There's nothing more to it. Okay? So anything that's more complicated than that, nobody does. It's only lean factoring polynomials and drawing decision regions. It's no, you don't need any background. All the terminology around it is completely confusing, but ultimately you're doing only that. Okay, so. I have a lot of confidence when you go into the exam hall. I don't, I don't ask complicated questions. I'll never ask questions for which we have to do 10 pages to find a root. Yes, it will never happen. Okay, so if, if you find that you're writing pages after pages, then something is wrong. Go back and check and see if there is, or maybe the question is wrong. Ask me what, what the right question was. Okay. So don't go on and on and do for 30 minutes and do that. So and unfortunately, the last question pretty much nobody attempted. Was there anybody here who really attempted the last question? No. I think nobody really even looked at it. So I'll have to do some serious thinking about how to grade that. But anyway, so let me uh, let me do that. The last question also, there is a major red herring in the last question, as in this this big description of g of f and all that. But I just gave it for completion. You don't need the g of f. Okay, so it's this uh, you you have to look at it carefully and see what the meaning of that question was. Okay, for instance, look at the first part of that last question. What is the white and match filter right the match filter you can write down without any thinking there is no reason to worry about the match filter what is the match filter g of f times c of f conjugate that's the match filter there's nothing more to it right that people may have been able to write but i saw very few people even who wrote down that 
Okay, I think for some reason they were totally confused about the voltage spectrum right away. You don't have to worry about the voltage spectrum when you write the match filter. Match filter is just H star of F. Just in this case, it's just H of F. Everything is real. So that's all. You just write H of F is G of F times C of F, which is what? 1 plus E power minus J. So if, if you're worried about implementing it, how do you implement it? You might want to do it in with some delay lines in analog or you can even do it digitally by interchanging etc. But that all that is different. But match filter, writing it down is very simple. Well, there is a, I should be careful. Let me take back what I was saying. C of F is actually complex. So you'll have to do C star carefully there. Okay. So H of F is what? Is G of F times, which is real, times C of F, which will work out as 1 plus, I can't remember the constant, I think 5 by 2. Was it 5 by 2? E power minus J 2 pi F T. And then the next one was 1, is it? Next one was 1. E power minus J 4 pi F T. Okay, this is H of F. So the match filter is simply H star of F. This would have given you like some 3 marks. You know? <laughs> you know, very few people have written it. But I'll see. I'll see what to do about it. So it says G of F. Maybe G star of F is for comfort. 1 plus 5 by 2. E power J 2 pi F T plus e pa j 4 pi t. Yeah, yeah, this is the match filter zone. Now, this is part of the whiten match filter, right? So, the first part is the match filter. The next step comes the whitening, right? So, do it stepwise. The first step, everybody should be able to do, right? There's no, even if you can't figure out what the folded spectrum is, you can do the match filter. That's what I'm trying to say. Match filter you can do very easily. Just close your eyes and write the formula for the match filters. Nobody will question you for that. The next thing is to find the folded spectrum and factor it. Okay, yeah, maybe there is something non-trivial there. It's also not very non-trivial, but it's something something there. Find the folded spectrum. So that division you should know. The match filter does not require any spectral factorization. The whitening requires spectral. The optimal whitening requires spectral factorization, right? So this people must have been able to write. So they, everybody started with the 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 response out after the match filter automatically assuming the h star of f thinking that it's not very trivial okay so anyway so how do you find the folded spectrum after the sampler the match filter okay so you know already what the formula is right so it's going to be if i write say s of e power j the folded spectrum e power j 2 pi f t is going to work out as 1 by t what summation m equals minus infinity to infinity i'll do it in one way and then i'll give you an intuition for why that answer makes sense okay so h of f minus m by t squared okay so keep it in this form don't simplify any further than that so if you do this you'll see you get 1 by t summation m equals minus infinity to infinity mod g of f minus m by t squared times what times Simply mod CF squared. Why will M by T go away? If you put F minus M by T, what will happen to these things? These are all symbol rate events. Okay, so they will not change when you fold an alias. Okay, so anything periodic like that will not change. It has to make sense, right? If, and the same thing is going to have, happen after T, after 2T, and I'm doing everything at symbol rate of the receiver. So if I take care, there's no ISI with my transmit and receive filters. The only ISI should be caused by the channels delay okay if the channel is not at symbol rate then you have trouble okay like you do in the wireless multipath situation okay then you have to do all kinds of equalization but if your channel taps channel is doing just something at symbol rate you can clearly do very simple equalization no no reason to do anything else okay it's not doing anything else so that's the so this is a very mathematical way of showing it but intuitively it should be clear to you it's enough if you kill the isi for one one path from the channel. The other paths will also get cleared simultaneously. The only thing that will be left is what the channel introduced at some point. Okay, so you have to deal with that. So you pull the mod C of F square outside. What will happen to 1 by T summation that? It will become 1. So you simply get the folded spectrum as mod C of F square. Okay. So now what is S of Z? Okay, so it's C of Z times c star of 1 by z star so you'll get 1 plus 5 by 2 z inverse plus z power minus 2 times 1 plus 5 by 2 z plus z square okay all right so so this step is a little bit tricky okay so i'm not saying it's 
very trivial you should have understood some very very many things about digital communication to make this jump but if you blindly apply the formula you get the answer still there's no problem and if you know how to manipulate it you still get the answer okay so at that level this question is also not too complicated okay if you had a if you were confident about the problem and if you see the problem you would have done it there's no problem i think if you are already worried and upset and thinking of so many things it's tough to do okay so that's the problem so next time you write this exam first of all believe that you can do the problem and i don't ask too many difficult things it's very simple things that i'll ask just write the formula down the answer will follow okay and have some trust and faith in the way i test the question okay so you write this so now what should you do what's the next step factor so what do you need for factoring this okay once again you need the quadratic uh, thing okay but you have to be careful here okay so here also the terms will come out very carefully i believe this will factor as 4 times 1 minus half z inverse squared 1 minus half z squared okay so you might want to check this okay so i might have made some mistake but it will factor something into something like this okay so you identify this as gamma z squared gamma squared this becomes your m star of 1 by z star and your y tenor is 1 by 4 1 minus half z squared that's your y tenor and you see your y tenor is what it's it's not a good filter it's ir anti causal right so but if you do it then you get what you get the minimum phase channel response to be exactly this 1 minus half z inverse square so the whole channel the equivalent channel is simply sk going through oh 1 plus huh? it's plus is it okay it's the same as this no no so he's pointing out he's factoring this okay so be very careful lot of people gave this answer which really disturbed me the minimum phase part of the factorization has z and z inverse does that make sense okay minimum phase the minimum phase part of the spectral factorization has to be monic causal and minimum phase one moment you have z inverse and z what does it mean it's got something else it can't be minimum phase lot of people factored the 4 minus z square minus z power minus 1 with the z in the answer for the minimum phase okay so that doesn't make sense so what he is doing is also something like that he's got a zero inside the unit circle and he's got a zero outside the unit circle the zero outside the unit circle where should it go it should go to the maximum phase part it cannot be in the minimum phase part okay so that's how we do it so am i right i think this is fine the sign was wrong of course but i think this is fine okay so you will get 1 minus half z inverse square and then noise this is your zk all right so now you do the match filter bound and the and the, i think i asked zero forcing dfe the it's very easy all those things are very easy. so you can do those things in just two steps for this problem okay so this was the third question and uh, Okay so I'll tell you what's disturbing me about this whole exam though so it's fine i mean the actual specific answers might be okay but overall i think people have close to zero confidence that they can do something in digital communication okay so i think i'm sure there are a few people who are not like that but most people seem to be very unsure of themselves when they look at a problem which is very which is very uh, scary for me because i think I think the way I'm doing this course, I'm just telling you simple ways of doing the problems, right? So ultimately, that's what I'm doing. I'm giving you very simple ideas for suppose this is a channel, suppose this is a transmit filter, this is a channel, this is a receive filter. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Is what I've been doing. And so suddenly, for some reason, I think maybe the problem was spectral factorization. Somehow you think you're convinced the spectral factorization is completely complicated. You don't have to use any root finding methods. Okay? So that's the that seems to have stumped most people. Okay? <coughs> it's also i mean people were saying it's difficult to do it as part of a dsp course so maybe the thing to do would have been for me to spend some time i should have probably spent some time on spectral factorization in the beginning i thought i did but I, maybe i didn't do it in this specific way to show you how it can be done in a very simple way without uh, too many complications okay so 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 i think that's that pretty much covers it probably the only thing that that requires some care is this third problem part a but other than that the other things must must be okay
okay so any questions any questions so people are okay everybody is smiling and happy and i don't know i saw a record number of people show up for the exam some 40 people everybody everybody was there class usually this hardly at least this is a week before the exam there were hardly like 10 15 people so uh, so suddenly surprise i saw a lot of people i have never seen before where is this guy coming from uh, as usual they are not here in today's class also so let me do a rough count in 21 yeah 29 20 28 20 27 people in class this is the usual number anyway okay so 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 yeah so one question to ponder about is what happens what happens if these guys are not are not at symbol time okay suppose this this is some tau 1 and this is some tau 2 okay so this is exactly the problem that people deal with in wireless communication so when you are moving for instance in mobile communication whenever you transmit you pretty much get this channel you get a channel which does what's called multi path so the same signal will come to you at different times you don't see anything else so but but the multi path is not guaranteed to be at symbol symbol time okay so it will be some other time so then look at what happens to your fold spectrum okay so then see what you should do and that will give you a lot of ideas for how to work with the <coughs> work with the multi paths but the current popular way of working with it is slightly different what's the very popular way of working with these multi path things so something called ofdm which is used all the time so it will take care of all these things in a very nice way okay so that's that's one more thing maybe we'll see it if we have some time but but that's a different problem it changes the problem altogether once this is not multiple of symbol time these factors won't go away they'll stay for every term and the spectrum changes folded spectrum changes completely so what you have to do is very different when the multi path is not at symbol time okay all right so that's pretty much the only comment i wanted to make so i don't know about this question so is this is this okay this is okay right so so in future you might get questions where you have to do is that level of spectral factorization so this will be the only thing that will be required nothing more so don't worry about if there are some z terms here and all things become more complicated but it's very unlikely that i'll ever ask such things in an exam okay so maybe in an assignment when you have matlab or something i might ask it but if you don't have matlab it's very unlikely that i'll ask okay so don't worry about it okay and uh, yeah so this problem requires some care so these are all approximate expressions that's fine okay so so i mean i, I don't want to draw the actual structure for the zero forcing dfe and the mmse dfe i think you can figure it out it's just a formula you know where the what the filters are should be fine here also it's okay i think the match filter bound is you see now okay so i think uh, that brings us conclusion of quiz 2 quiz 2 discussion so let's move on to so what i want to do for the rest of this class is briefly review what we've been doing in, uh, in equalization okay so the last thing we were doing was what what is the last thing we were doing we were doing adaptive equalization right so so let me see so i should, I should try to remind you what the okay so so overall the way the way most equalizers work okay so this is the the adaptive equalizer is how most equalizers are actually implemented of course in ofdm you do something else but uh, in if you want to implement a time domain equalizer mostly it's done like this and the principle hopefully you remember so if you have a if you have what so what is the model i think did i did i pick any nice model for the whole thing just to pick the model 
Okay, so suppose you have, uh, so the way the whole model works is you have an SK at the transmitter, you put it through a transmit filter, right, this is at symbol red, then it goes through the channel, okay, of course there is an up conversion which I never show, okay, and then there is a channel which is the baseband equivalent, okay, and then the question is what do you do for processing it at the receiver and usually like I said in most cases most people would do G star minus T. Okay, so you match it only to the transmit filter because that's the only thing that is known. You don't know the channel. So usually you match it to the transmit filter or you might even not want to match it to the transmit filter. You simply want to do a low, low pass filtering. That also might be okay. So you could do that also. There's some ways of doing it but you can also match it to the transmit filter. That's one possibility. So there's no, no, no thing wrong with that. And then you do symbol rate sampling. Okay. Suppose you have a scenario like this. Okay, this is one way of doing it. Remember, there are other options here for the match filtering. You can do, if you know C of T, you can do the optimal match filtering, or you can do something. There's so many other possibilities there. Or low pass filtering is always something that can be done, followed by a symbol rate sampler. Okay. So overall, if you imagine this is ZK. Okay. So noise gets added here. I'm sorry. For some reason I forgot. Noise. Okay. So overall, from SK to ZK, you're going to have a channel which is which is similar to the generalized equalization channel that we had, right? So you can expect that this will be some H of Z, noise added, uh, NK, ZK. Okay, so whatever you do here, this could also be a low pass filter. Okay, remember. Okay, so you want to pick this uh, match filter in some way so you, you do that once you pick it you actually have a expression like this so you can imagine you are actually trying to equalize a finite tab channel roughly in most cases it will work okay so that's something that's always done so you try to equalize a channel okay so what do you do first thing we saw was what do you do if there is no constraint on the complexity of the equalizers and all these things so you we derived a whole bunch of things zero forcing dfe zero forcing linear equalizer uh, MMSC linear equalizer, MMSC DFE, all of them had some implementation problems. They were all okay. We were able to compare it and they worked. Okay, so usually the MMSC DFE is a good option. Okay, if you can implement it or the zero forcing DFE. If you cannot implement the MMSC DFE, you do the zero forcing DFE. So basically, if no, if there's no constraint on complexity of your filtering, okay. You want to do mostly say zero forcing DFE or or MMSE DFE. Okay, so that's pretty much a very good strategy to use. And like I said, the MMSE DFE, maybe the unbiased MMSE DFE has some canonical structure which people have shown is capacity approaching also. There's not that much suboptimality in doing that. Okay, so one can do the MMSE DFE quite safely. But in practice, you're not going to have such things, and you don't even know what the H of Z is. So when you don't know H of Z, Okay, no constraint on complexity, you know H of Z. Okay, so the next case we considered was finite tap equalizers. As in both the precursor as well as the postcursor is finite tap. If you are doing only precursor and no postcursor, you pick your precursor to be both sided, right? So you pick minus L and plus L, minus N plus N, I forget, I think minus P and plus PA2. So you pick something like that. And if you know H of Z, you can solve a linear equation to get the optimal taps. I fully set it up for the linear equalizer case. For the DFE also, I showed you how to set it up, but I, well, I, I didn't really show you how to set up the optimal thing for the DFE. We only, we only saw the adaptive version, right? But anyway, for the DFE also, you can set up a similar thing. So maybe an assignment problem I'll give for setting up something like that. So you know H of Z means you know the statistics of ZK. Once you know the statistics of ZK, it becomes a classic estimation problem, finding the signals that were sent. And it's very, very simple and easy to see. The second order things are important for the minimum mean square error criteria. And you get this phi inverse alpha. Okay, so you do that, you get the linear equation solving. Okay, the practical case, the really practical case is when you have a finite tap equalizer, when you want a finite tap equalizer and in addition, don't know K, don't know H, I'm sorry. 
in which case you won't even know the statistics of the zk that are coming in so the estimation problem becomes that much more complicated you'll have to also estimate several things in the way okay and you don't want to do a very complicated big estimation so you simply do a iterative solution which is a very nice way of doing it what what i showed was this gradient gradient search or lms algorithm right so the lms is the uh, is the best way of doing things the way it works the structure is roughly as follows so you have zk coming in so i'll show for the dfe type situation you have a, a precursor equalizer which uh, i think what was my notation for the precursor c of z yeah? c of z okay and then you have plus minus you have a slicer here and then you have say d of z okay i'm not sure my notation might have been complicated Okay, so you usually pick C of Z in a DFE case to be what of the form M equals minus P to 0 CM C power M. Okay, well, I don't know, I think 0 to P maybe. Okay, so you see, so this is, this is, uh, precursor is chosen to be one-sided, right, in the anti-causal direction and D of Z is going to be chosen as m equals say 0 to p if you want or say p prime k okay, dm z power minus so it's going to be picked as oh no i think this should be oh, i'm getting confused here. it should be minus m again okay so you pick d of z to be something like this okay and then you set up a set up one vector which includes all the coefficients of c and the coefficients of d okay and and you set up your iterative method for the lms okay so i, I might have written it down i forget I don't have it here okay so okay so maybe I'll write it down maybe I wrote it down somewhere else I don't, have, don't seem to have it here the last class I might have might have written it down okay so the basic uh, thing to keep in mind is initially when you start out C of Z and D of Z will have to be randomly chosen values and there's no reason why you should get good performance so usually when you do when you don't know h of z and you have to adapt to an unknown h of t there will be two distinct phases in your receiver in one phase the first phase which is called the training phase you have to assume that you know what is sk okay so this output of the slicer which is s hat of k this is known during the training phase okay so depending on how complicated or how much you can afford you have a long enough training sequence okay so a sequence which is known both to the transmitter and the receiver and which is transmitted at first by the transmitter so you might want to pick say 100 symbols 1000 symbols 10000 symbols how many of you need depending on the number of taps you have and how you how well you want to adapt you will first send that okay so the slicer pretty much will have to work but you won't use the s hat of k from the slicer during the training phase during the training phase you will use the symbols from the known sequence okay and compute the error okay the error term is crucial in your in your adapting right so if you look at the formula there's this uh, well the formula works roughly like this okay so let me see let me see if we have the formula properly written down okay ck plus 1 is ck plus beta times E k Z k star right am I right this is how I wrote down and the C k will actually be will actually contain both C minus P all the way to C 0 then it will also contain well this will be M equals 1 right so D 1 to D P prime Okay, it will be a vector which contains all your coefficients and you will have to compute error also suitably. Okay, so you will have to adjust everything according to how this uh, computation is done. Okay, so this ek during the training phase will be computed only with the known sequence and you move to in the next phase is called the decision directed phase. When you believe that you have acquired the channel reasonably. So it is called acquisition, channel, channel acquisition. During the training phase you acquire the channel. And now you have acquired your C and D to an acceptable fashion. And then you move to a decision directed phase where you actually use the output of the slicer for computing the error. Ok. 
Okay, so you do that and you run your uh, equalizer. Okay, so that's that's one way of doing a time domain equalizer in practice. Okay, so this beta is also a thing that has to be chosen. It's mostly a fudge factor. So you, you just pick something. Okay, so something like 0.1. Just pick that number. Then if you see that you're not converging or if things are going all over the place, you either decrease it or you increase it if you see that you're converging very slowly. Okay, so you do one of those things, adjust it according, accordingly and you can do that. Okay, so that's how you pick your beta. In this way, you can adapt your channel equalizer taps and get to the channel that you want and after that move to the decision directed phase. Okay, in the decision directed phase, your equalizer will vary if the channel varies slowly. Right? If it varies too fast, it may not be able to keep up with it. But if it varies slowly, your equalizer can still keep up with it. Okay, how much the variation and all that we can quantify using this eigenvalue stuff. Okay, so how fast it varies, there are some bounds, how, how quickly it converges. Right? The convergence speed is decided by the eigenvalues of the of what? The autocorrelation matrix for zk. Okay, so you do zk's autocorrelation matrix, its eigenvalues and the spread of its eigenvalues will determine how quickly your equalizer converges. So that will also in turn determine how quickly your channel can vary, how much you can keep track of. So all these things are, I mean, there's no strict way of properly analyzing them, but some rough way of getting a feel for how that works. And the eigenvalue spread also depends on what? The channel response. Okay, so I gave you some bounds. So if the channel is very widely varying, then you can expect the eigenvalues also to be very largely spread. Okay, so that might be an interesting thing to look at. Okay, so this is uh, this is where we are, and uh, so quickly running out. So I'll give you a brief uh, uh, overview of what we are going to do for the next few classes. In the next few classes, the first thing I'll consider is a very practical receiver, which includes many of the blocks that you will see in a practical receiver. Okay, so things like career career synchronization, timing synchronization, all these things I've never talked about. Okay, so all those things I'll try to introduce very briefly. We have a very high overview of what's done. We won't go into great details here. Most of that is still considered an art. Okay, so you just do it. <laughs> Any way you want, you can do it. Nobody will question you too much. There's no optimality as far as uh, we're concerned. That's one thing we'll see. And then the next thing I want to see is uh, briefly look at some, some more practical techniques Techniques like things like DPSK, I don't know if you've heard about it, differential phase shift keying and a few other things which are which are useful in practice. Some things we have never seen but uh, some nice and smart ideas which, which help you avoid some problems in practice. Okay, so that's one more thing we'll see. And after that, time permitting, we'll see some OFDM. And after that, time permitting, we might see some simple coding. Okay, so with that, we'll pretty much sign off uh, with this course. Okay. So hopefully I'll be able to return your answer sheets by tomorrow or day after and after that you can see how it goes.